So we kick off with some transition metal chemistry. Um, so we've got some copper sulfate in aqueous solution and we're going to add some ammonia to that and also some HCl. So this is where you really need to know your transition metal chemistry um, and the complexes that it forms. So your complex iron that will form will be uh, four ammonia ligands around the copper uh, you still have your two waters, like so, and overall it's going to have a two plus charge, and the colour of that one will be blue. Uh, for the next one, you're going to uh, make CuCl4, and the charge on that is going to be two minus, the colour for that is going to be yellow. So it then gives me the ethane dioate iron and asks me what is meant by the term bidentate ligand. Well, a bidentate ligand donates two electron pairs to a metal ion and forms two coordinate bonds to a metal ion. So that's a really important definition that you know. So the first uh, one, uh, first area isomer I'll do is going to be the optical um, isomer. So if you imagine a uh, mirror there, and we're going to reflect it, and we will do it this one here. So if we reflect it, we will have O, O there, and O there, and O there, um, and then this one would become H2O, and that's H2O like so, and then fill in like so uh, your double bond O's like so. So that is the mirror image of that one. Um, so it is optical. The next one, it's going to be uh, the trans isomer. Um, so you're going to have the OH2 there, OH2 there, and then OO like so, OO there, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O. And this is a trans isomer because the water ligands are opposite each other. Okay, so this is a counting um, exercise. So if you count up, you've got one copper, you're going to have four carbons, uh, four hydrogens, and ten oxygens. And overall, remember the charge on the copper is two plus. Each of these uh, bidentate ligands are two minus, so you've got four minus overall, so the overall charge is going to be two minus. So put some square brackets and then two minus like so. Okay, so this is uh, quite an interesting one. They've actually given me the rate equation and they want me to um, prove that this is correct. Okay, so... First of all, let's look at hydrogen peroxide. The reason I choose this is, well, logically it's experiment one and two, but also it's dead easy. Um, if you have a look, you can see that from one and two, I double the concentration of peroxide, but iodide and also H plus stays the same. So if I double the hydrogen peroxide, I actually double the initial rate and therefore it is first order of respect to hydrogen peroxide. The next logical one is to actually look at H+. Um, if I look now at experiments 2 and 3, you can see that hydrogen peroxide stays the same, iodide stays the same, but I double the concentration of H+. However, the initial rate stays exactly the same, and therefore it is zero order of respect to H+, which is why it doesn't appear in the rate equation. So now you know it's zero order with respect to H+, plus, we can ignore this column here because that will have no effect on the rate. So the one I need to find out is iodide. So in order to do that, let's look at 3 and 4. So I'm going to double the hydrogen peroxide concentration here. Um, so if I do 1.14 times 10, to the minus 5 times 2, I get 
2.28 times 10 to the minus 5. However, the rate is actually 4.56 times 10 to the minus 5. So if I divide that by 2.28 times 10 to the minus 5, I get 2. And if you have a look at that, I have doubled the iodide concentration as well. So you'd expect, if it's first order, to double the rate. So in total, my rate has gone by a factor of 4, and that's because that's gone by a factor of 2, and that's gone by a factor of 2, and they are first, both, first, they are both first order with respect to each other. Okay, and now I just need to calculate the rate constant. So we've got the equation, so the rate constant um, is going to equal the rate divided by the concentration of peroxide times the concentration of I minus. My rate, if I do experiment one, is 5.7 times 10 to the minus six. And that's going to be divided by 0 0.001 times 0 0.2. And so to two significant figures, which is what they want, that's 0 0.029. Your units, we can replace um, the uh, numbers by units. And you will see that we can cancel that out there with that. So my units are going to be moles to the minus one, decimeters cubed, seconds to the minus one. So the student now thinks that H plus acts as a catalyst. Um, why is that not correct? Well, if you look at the equation, um, H plus ions are actually used up. They're in, they occur in the equation. Remember, a catalyst is not used up, whereas H plus clearly occurs in the overall equation and they are used up and therefore they are not a catalyst. What is meant by the rate determining step? It is the slowest step in the reaction. OK, so I've put the equation here so we can see it. Um, step one, uh, we are going to use the uh, two reactants that are in the rate determining step. So that is H2O2 plus I minus. You can see I've got to make water as one of my products. So that could make H2O plus OI minus. Now I haven't used an H plus, so one of these could come in now. H plus could react with this um, OI minus because I want to get rid of that. And that could give me this product which I've got to make here, HIO. For the next one, I've got to get rid of this OH minus because that doesn't appear in the overall step. I also need to use up another H plus which is in uh, the overall equation, but I've only used one so far. And if you put those together, that gives me my other water. So the first thing they want me to do is to find the enthalpy change of hydration for question three. So this is obviously one you need to know. It's the enthalpy change for one mole of gaseous ions forming one mole of aqueous ions. Right, so I now need to link those four enthalpy changes. So I've got a huge lattice enthalpy of potassium sulfate, which we would expect. So let's pop these in. So down at the bottom, I am going to have K2SO4 solid. Um, and obviously the K2SO4 solid is formed from K2 plus or rather 2K plus in the gaseous state plus SO4 to minus in the gaseous state. And this change is going to be minus 1763. Right, so this first one here uh, on the right hand side, let's say that is going to be the enthalpy change of hydration of potassium ions. So that's going to be two times 
minus 320 and therefore on the um, line I'm going to end up with 2k plus aqueous now but I haven't done anything to my sulfate that is still in the gaseous state so I need another line going along here where I do actually have my sulfate so that's going to be the hydration of sulfate ions uh, to give me 2k plus aqueous plus now SO4 to minus aqueous and therefore this arrow here going up um, which is plus 24 is going to be the enthalpy change of solution of potassium sulfate. Now some people worry about whether this line here is above or below this one. Well they've given me a clue here for that because it's an endothermic change um, for this arrow it's got to be above the um, K2SO4 solid. So the next part of the question wants me to find the enthalpy change of hydration of sulfate ions which is this change here. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use the same method we've used for Hess cycle. Let's draw a little circle around and put arrows going around. Now all the arrows that are going clockwise have to equal the arrows going anti-clockwise. So you can see this one is going clockwise, this one is going clockwise. So uh, 2 times minus 320 is minus 640. Um, and we've also got plus uh, D, which is what we're trying to find out, is equal to 24 plus, but in this case it's going to be minus 170. Six, three. So if we rearrange that, D is going to equal minus 1099 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so 3C. The entropy change of solution of potassium sulfate is plus 225 joules per kelvin per mole. Why is that? Well, um, it's obviously positive um, value and quite a significantly positive value and that's because the aqueous particles are far more disordered than they are in the solid. In the solid, uh, the potassium ions and sulfate ions are in fixed positions but when they're dissolved in water, those ions are free to move around. So the disorder has um, increased. There is much more disordered disorder in the aqueous system. Okay, so they now want me to explain using a calculation why potassium sulfate dissolves in water despite the enthalpy change of solution being negative. So let's pop some numbers in. So um, delta H is going to be 24 um, kilojoules per mole. They told me that on the previous page. Minus T, 25 degrees C is the same as 298 Kelvin. Remember, for temperature, we have to use Kelvin. And delta S, they told me, is 2 to 5 joules per mole per Kelvin. So I need to change that. So let's get rid of that. I'm going to change that to uh, be divided by 1,000. So times 0 0.225. Um, remember, because that's in joules per kelvin per mole, I have to change it into kilojoules per kelvin per mole because delta H is in kilojoules per mole. So, if I do that, I get 24 minus 67.05, which is going to be minus 43.05. kilojoules per mole for delta G. So to go into a reason then, um, delta G is negative. Um, so because delta G is negative, 
this reaction is feasible and therefore it will the potassium sulfate will dissolve in water.